On this side, we have some widely contrasting examples taken from recent recordings to give you some idea of the wealth now available on the wider tapestry of stereophonic sound. We are controlling transmission. Welcome, gentlemen of the realm. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the round table. We are concluding this week with a discussion of what we've read and all uh, related to literature. So um, we're going to go through a quick re-intro. Of course, uh, I'm going to be your host for this part. I am Keith, and to my left is Jesse. Hi, everybody. My name is Jesse. That's all I got. I'm tired. Nice. This is clearly <laughs> our third intro for the night. Uh, <laughs> and next we got Thomas. Hello, I'm Thomas. Read fables now. <laughs> Excellent. And T Dog. What's going on? I am uh, T Dog, also named Thomas, and also recommend reading fables. Yes. Excellent. And of course, everybody's favorite comic critic, Host Sway. Uh, yeah, it's me. And meeting Jody Hauser this week has been the only uh -huh. thing like, that to keeping me by for not going to Rose City Comic Con. But now that I think about it, she was going to be there too, and I'm missing out on that too. <laughs> and, to and, and now you have a comic of hers that is not signed. <laughs> I could have got, gotten the other six signed of hers. <laughs> so, all right, guys. Um, so, we're going to jump straight into literature for the week. Um, I do have a bit of news. Um, Jesse brought up that Death Note is getting a one shot in manga. Uh, yeah. So, so, do we have any details about. Is it a retelling? Is it a continued story? Do we know anything yet? They haven't really said any too much as to what it's actually going to take place with. It literally got announced today. Uh, so all we know, it's going to be a one-shot, uh, which is just going to be a very... It's not going to be a continued series. So you're just going to get a, a little bit of that extra taste of uh, you know, Death Note. Uh, so anyone who was you know, a fan of the show or a fan of the manga, you're going to get a little bit more. So there you go. <laughs> That's really awesome because, as I've told you before, Death Note is one of the few mangas and animes that I love, that I'm truly loyal to. So, um, I'll check it out. Um, it can't be any worse than the Netflix station. <laughs> I still gotta watch that at some point for a review. Uh, it's um, so bad. <laughs> do you guys think it's like gonna still be like uh, kind of like an update on the main character, or is it like a side character that should like get its own like little one shot? Did you ever See, watch? Uh, did you ever watch Death Note? No, I know not. Almost okay, because like, uh, I don't think there's yeah. going to be much of an update to the main character. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it could, be, it could be like a not like a flashback, or like, in, or like cool. where, where he was, yeah, mm -hmm. in between like a, in between an arc or something. Uh, almost Maybe. like a failure. I mean, yeah, manga does that way more than Western. So, that's but do you true. think there's like a, another character that deserves like at least like a one shot to tell? Since like there, the main, there, there's some really good mm -hmm. good characters. I always enjoyed uh, knowing more about. Uh, the actual, uh, what, what are, well, I can't remember what it's called right now. Shinigami. Yeah, I was really like like knowing more about the. Sh so if we get more of that, I'd be down. Yes. Yeah, totally. I, ordered I mean, some... I... I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll just say I really like just the style of Death Note, so I'll take it however I can get it. If you say you're gonna, you ordered some Shinigami, I'm gonna punch you in the I kidney. I did at Sashi <laughs> Bomber. That was pretty good. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> Moving on from that questionable racism. Uh, so, I want to talk about R.A. Salvatore. Um, if you guys, I don't know if you read fantasy novels, uh, I gather that most of our reading is manga and comics, but um, R.A. Salvatore is a fantasy author who writes this ongoing series. Um, he works for Wizards of the Coast, specifically writing within D&D &D worlds. And he created the character Driss the Dark Elf, which a lot of people uh, in nerd, nerdy circles really know uh, a lot about. He's this awesome, you know, swashbuckler. Basically, Nightcrawler, if you couldn't teleport. Um, so he's great. I love him to death. Uh, the new book just came out this week, and this marks the 49th book that Ari Salvatore has written as part of this ongoing story. Whoa. So I haven't gotten it yet. Uh, it's my next purchase. I'm very excited about it. Um, it's just it, it's such a great series, but it is a deep dive that you really have to commit to. Um, but I always recommend it, especially if you like epic fantasies and 
you know, all, he he writes action like just as well as any actor or as any writer I've read. So, uh, but the new book is called Boundless, and it came out on the tenth. So, um, last bit of news. Okay, so Powers of X four came, and I was talking to Josue about this earlier. I promise um, I'll be reading it this coming week. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, non spoilery version of what happens. Uh, Xavier and Magneto meet up with Mr. Sinister. If you read the X-Men comics recently, you know that Mr. Sinister has actually killed himself. And so there's a whole bunch of him out there. Uh, they basically go to a place called the Bar Sinister, which is where they all live. Um, with Hickman, he does all these cool little side things. And he put the Red Diamond, all the best news and gossip from Bar Sinister. And this actually teases some future storylines. So I'm going to go through the secrets that they, that are being murdered and gossiped about in the Bar Sinister. So the first one, it's just a funny one, I think. It just says, he's trying to pretend that no one noticed he was wearing red shoes, but this truly sinister sinister isn't fooling anyone. So I, I think they're basically saying the one with red shoes is the real sinister. Um, this one's interesting because I, I can't really decipher exactly what this one is about. Um, it says, and speaking of fashion... The Whisper Network has turned into a roar regarding the return of this trend-setting mutant who was cut down in his prime. Will someone please tell all the mutants to stop wearing human clothes and join the stampede across their island full of flowers to the flower that's the list? So, trend-setting mutant who was cut down in his prime. I couldn't really place it unless... But specifically a male now? Or specifically a um, he, he. He said... Damn, yeah. okay. I was gonna say like, well, the only the only trend setting mutant is fucking Dazzler, but guess not. Yeah, um, that's trends? what I was thinking. So, so I mean, trend, se- at- trend setting would either also be Wolverine. I mean, I just- mean yeah, depending on if, if you want to be like, you know, fourth wall or not, you know. <laughs> right. I was thinking I mean, Nightcrawler, but that's, what that, but that's but that's what that scene is though too. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next one. This is awesome. It says years ago, a deceased redheaded pretender made a pact with the devil. When she passed on, most believe that any secret she had went with her to the grave. Won't everyone be surprised when they find out not only is this not true, but she left behind a whole lot more than secrets? This is Madeline Pryor for me. Yeah, it's got to be. Yeah, and I'm really excited if they're going to do something with that. And there's actually another one a little bit later on that relates to that, so I don't want to on this one too much. Um. This one right here. Um, while every sinister has been busy wondering how they might be affected by current events, almost no one noticed what washed ashore. A word of advice to all things sinister. Don't embrace the revelry or there won't be anything for you to celebrate. So that one's really out there and not really specifically detailed. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is cool. This is this is not one of the numbered secrets, but I think it's interesting. Um, they reveal that only one of the sinisters is actually a mutant. And he's not actually a mutant. He made himself a mutant by using mutant DNA. And they actually found what mutant he used the DNA for. And it's really random and interesting. So this says, certain people are wondering where the tyrant dispelling sinister got his mutant gene. And while that isn't a really interesting story, the DNA originally belonged to Thunderbird. The original Thunderbird. John Proudstar. The fuck? Okay. Yeah. So now I want to know that story. <laughs> like, so yeah, Thunderbird, like the powerhouse dude, right? Yeah, the one that dies in Classic X Men Three. Yeah. 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 So I'm curious, like Warpath's brother. Yeah. Warpath. So, yeah. Okay. No, my friend. So, okay. okay. Yeah. So I'm curious about. That. Okay. All right. This one's interesting. He's the best there is at what he does. So that's Wolverine. We let's. <laughs> we'll just, um, she's married with a kid. The husband knows exactly what's going on, but who is he to point the finger? He's up to much the same and more. Maybe this is just the new normal on this mutant island. So, Wolverine's what? screwing up married? And I'm trying to think who was married with a kid. Uh, I mean, Ichi. I mean, like, the Japanese lady, right? For Daken? Daken? But, it, well, they said on this island, the mutant island, so... I mean, Japanese island... No, no, it's a reference to Krakoa, the new island they live on. Oh, oh I mean, to now, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, so, the only time he was married or had a kid was in Japan, and it's also an island. Yeah, so he's up to much of the same, it says. So I'm curious about that. I'm wondering if it's a reference to Gene and Scott, and Scott's screwing around with Emma, maybe? 
Oof. So, which I would love Emma Frost with Scott. So. Um, okay, this one. Everyone believed that the plan of this progerian mutant with secret sinister ties, ties was foiled, but little did the gifted ones know that the destroyed samples were switched out beforehand. So, this one is weird. Um, I'm trying to think of who this could be. Uh, so, it said um, progerian. It's a uh, genetic disorder. It's when kids age rapidly. Apocalypse? Just, that's what I'm thinking. Like, kid apocalypse? Because he's in it. Like, we know adult apocalypse is coming up. So, uh, But it's interesting because the way they said uh, the destroyed samples were switched out beforehand. So I'm like, what does that mean, you know? Yeah. Um, and this one's pretty direct and straightforward. Two brothers jumped out of a plane, and for the longest time, until he was discovered, many wondered if there was a third. <laughs> yeah. If we uh, told you if we told you there were more, oh, would you believe God. me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that's a reference to Cyclops and Havoc, guys. And um, Vulcan. And Summer's brothers. Yeah, we know Vulcan's their third brother, but now they're like, maybe there's another. It's like, oh. We need more summers. <laughs> uh, this one says, For years, this fittest of all mutant has routinely surrounded himself with a particular numbered entourage. This is Apocalypse and the Four Horsemen, right? These hangers-on stick around for a while until they're eventually replaced with newer, more exciting members. What most people don't know is that if the original members returned, these pretenders would be dropped so fast their heads would spin. Oh, shit. And they're already teasing the original Horseman coming back. I saw that in the comic already. So that'll be interesting, especially since it's going to be a good guy. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, we're almost done. Uh, they say the kids are all right, but all is not right in paradise. This non-couple couple has been apart so long, friends are expecting that when they see each other again, fireworks are going to ensue. Is the universe ready? Judging by how unprepared everyone was for what happened so far, we kind of doubt it. A non-couple couple? couple um, I mean... Uh, Doesn't Jubilee shoot fireworks out of her hand? I, was gonna, I thought, I was gonna I thought Jubilee, Jubilee but, I didn't, but I didn't think... I don't think she's in a couple or anything. Um, I was personally thinking Shadow Cat and Colossus. I was going to say Colossus and married. Kitty. Yeah. Because Kitty, Kitty started dating Star-Lord recently or a few years back, so I'm not sure if they're still together. But that was non- her rebound. <laughs> right. But <laughs> that non-couple rebound. always couple... Well, yeah, it was always Colossus and Kitty. Yeah. So, I'm going to skip this one because I want to read it last. Uh, this other one. Which brainwashed mutant sinister was replaced long before a certain bald somebody knew and has been in on the game for almost as long as the game is being played? E. So, sinister replaced a brainwashed mutant. So, that's interesting. Okay, then this last one. This this gave me tangles from being... The, uh, for someone who grew up reading comics in the 80s, this is great. It says... We don't hear this word spoken often. So when we do, it's best to pay attention. Because when you square that circle, what took a long time to build can crum- can come crumbling-, crumbling down rather quickly. And then it just says, Inferno. So, the awesome hell crossover with Madeline Pryor, like they already wrote Madeline Pryor. Mm-hmm. Are we getting another Inferno with Madeline Pryor coming back? Are we going to have magic, you know, Ileana involved? Yeah, magic going, like, wild, yeah. I love the original Inferno series. It's got such great gothic, like, style, and it was so good, so. Yeah, that's one of my... Oh, we got another choppy there, buddy. Yeah, you chopped up, bud. Oh, my bad. I was just saying that Inferno is one of my favorite. I'm... Yeah, it's so good. It's like, the art is really creepy and stuff, like, especially for the oh, 80s. Yeah. And it was mm-hmm. really violent. Like, there's a lot of really messed up violence. I was kind of amazed that Comics Code was fine with it back in the 80s, so... Yeah, did you ever read the What If on Inferno? <laughs> Remind me. There was a What If, uh, you know, What If or the one, you know, the one-off comics, like, What If such and such happened? They had a What If the X-Men Lost Inferno one, which mm. was one of my all-time favorite comics, man. It's really cool. Like, um, basically, they lose... Uh, Nashtar ends up, like, you know, killing off everybody except Wolverine and kind of keeps mm. him as a pet. And kind of turns Wolverine into a demon. So it's like a scene where like Wolverine's eating like a baby. It's really jacked up. Oh, nice. That's crazy, yeah. dude. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So that's my news for the week. Um, now, as far as what I've read, um, I was kind of telling you guys earlier, I read the first four volumes of Invincible. Uh, I've read it before, but I wanted to go back to it because uh, Sir Thomas was going through it. 
Uh, I love it. It's so good. It's the best. It's it's the best. Like, it's Superboy, but better. It's just so good, and it's really violent. And there's a lot of really great jokes. And I fully recommend it. I read it on Amazon. As long as you have a um, uh, subscription for the uh, Kindle, it's free. So I think the whole run is because I'm already four volumes in, and I'm, it's not stopped me yet. So uh, as far as sing- single issues. Um, I read Lo- the new Loki. Uh, briefly talked about that. Uh, really good. They're really good breaking the fourth wall a bunch. There's a really funny joke where they're looking at the libraries of different people, and like you see Loki's stories, and they're like, "There's Thor's," and, and then Loki points off screen. And he's like, "Whose stories are that? It's even bigger than Thor's." And like, "Oh, that's Spider Man," because Spider Man has like nine comic book series, and then <laughs> and then they walk up to one that seems to stretch into infinity. Who's it? he's like, "Who this could this possibly be?" And like. Those are the stories of the Wolverine. <laughs> and he's just like, how could one man possibly have this many stories? They're like, yeah, we're responsible for that. So it's really funny. Like, I'm really enjoying it. Um, totally worth a read. It's really irreverent. Also, it's really dark because Nightmare is the bad guy. And in issue two, I think, you read issue two, right, Josue? Yeah. Like, the whole thing with the chick that he entered her nightmares and made a deal to come back to Earth. It was really dark and weird. She comes back in issue three if you haven't read it yet. Okay, yeah, no, I was going to check it she, out tonight. She's going to be an ongoing character, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I read Loki. I read the new issue of the Orville, which is, you know, it's just tidying me over until the show comes back, basically. <laughs> um, I read the new Daredevil, which was crazy good. Um, the big focus now is, because he's not there, other people are trying to dress up as Daredevil, mm-hmm. like random citizens. And they're getting themselves in situations they should not be in. Ooh, basically, okay. it's the start of the new arc, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the art changed, so fair well, warning there. The artist they... did change, um, but it's well, not it, terrible. It I mean, wasn't Chichetto not... again, anyway. But still, yeah, it's it's okay. It's just not great. You know what I mean? Like it, I, I, it, yeah. Um, but it, it's it's going to be really interesting, and um, it is focused on him being. Like, he started this now. Like, these people are getting hurt without him. And uh, it's going to be curious because he needs to be in it. Mm -hmm. Spider-Man is in this very significantly. Oh, okay. He actually has a part. He has a confrontation with the cop from Chicago. Oh, fuck. Okay. Oh, okay. I got to jump on it It's so good. Like, because it references back to the scene we kept talking about where Spider-Man went to Daredevil and said, you're done. Yeah. Like, Like, they reference back to that. So it's really cool. Um, and then I finally got a copy of Once in Future. Um, oh, yeah. I took that one out again just to talk about it. <laughs> so I'm a big Arthurian legend guy. Uh, I love Arthurian legend. Obviously, we all do with the name of the podcast. <laughs> um, but uh, I really like this. Um, one of the reasons I like New Excalibur so much and Captain Britain in my 13 is because it is based on uh, the Arthurian legend. There's good chunks about Excalibur the sword and it also touches on how the scabbard is magical. So uh, to see this here, and I, as soon as they put so much focus on the scabbard in the comic, I was sold because that's like that's like a true blue legend knowing about Arthurian legend, not just writing about a magic. Story, you know what I mean? So I dug it. The grandma is amazing, dude. Right? <laughs> like she's so great, and like the bit, like just so you guys know, like. They're basically digging up all of her weapons, and there's, like, guns and stuff in the middle of the forest. They get attacked by this monster, and she basically tells her her grandson to run, and he's running away. She's like, good, monsters usually follow um, motion. So basically the monster chases him while she's, like, digging through the weapons looking for the right one. uses it. It's so funny. (laughs) And then she's like, you need to drive me to this one place, and he's like, no, I'm taking you back to your home. And she, like wings him with a bullet just barely like with a gun <laughs> shoots him in like, the cheek the ear right yeah yeah so like and she and he's like what the hell man and she's like she's like I, I meant to just wing you but my hands are shaky like and i was just like, like this, you got like <laughs> yeah it was great so God. i'm i'm super excited as to how that's gonna go um it's very in demand very hard to find so glad oh, if i forgot okay one. um so since you know a little more about it what does she mean by like uh, like the cliffhanger, like it could also it could mean like the return of like the dark part, the dark hour. 
So, I mean, I, it just depends because the whole thing with because I've actually written a story in this in this uh, kind of idea, nice where um, modern knights of the round basically they're out there. No one knows where they're buried unless you've watched the new Hellboy movie. Um, but uh, the idea is that the knights of the round table will always be there to defend Britain when it needs it the most. Like that's the legend. When it's darkest, they'll come out and they'll defend. But, like, I think they're going to tease it, like, is it darkest because they came out? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, so, I'm kind of curious as to where that's going to go. Because yeah. I do love Arthurian legend, but oddly enough, I don't like... He's do you kind like of a, Sorry? I, I don't like Arthur all that much as a character. Okay. He's not the best character. He's kind of a dick, to be honest. For real. So, so yeah, I, I'm really curious as to where that's going to go. Yeah, I um, want to see, I want to see a, once we get, like, I want to see more of the art expand more because, like, I was talking like, when I talked about it, like Dan Mora, like, is was one of the names why it sold me on it, and like the title shot for like the the title shot with like the skull and the crown, like, I want to see more of that when you, when Dan Mora really expands like his art, like it looks great throughout the whole thing, and yeah. it looks amazing when that creature comes out, and that's really want to see more of. Yeah, and actually, um, do you have your copy in front of you right now? Yes. Um, I wanted to compliment the colorist. Her name is Tamara something. Yeah. Um, she does a great job. Like, when I open it, my roommate doesn't read comics, really. But I opened it, I was flipping through it, and he looked over my shoulder. He's like, holy crap, the coloring's great. Like, that was the first thing that jumped out at him. And I flipped through it, and I'm like, yeah, it really is. And I noticed her name is actually on the cover. Like, how often do the colorists get on the cover, you know? True. So that was it's kind of like... It's kind of a thing that's uh, been starting out more, too. Like, with uh, any Sean Murphy, Matt Hollingsworth is, like, right next to him, like, almost every time. Yep. So, um, that's all the comics I read. I did want to mention the, uh, this is kind of off topic for our general, you know, conversation, but it's kind of cool. Um, ESPN magazine, I know sports, 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 uh, <laughs> just, they just published their last print magazine and it happened to be the body issue for this year. I don't know if you guys know about the body issue. No. Is it the one with the legs? With the what? Legs? No. So the body issue is athletes posing nude, basically, but, like, covering stuff up and showing off their bodies. But it's not meant to be, like, a titillating thing. Like, these are legit athletes. So, like, I remember, like, uh, there's, like, baseball players who are, like, stout dudes, but they're just all muscle and, like, stuff like that. Just to show you how different, like, bodies can uh, be shaped. It's a really cool thing, like, uh, to, you know, see the dedication these people put in. The one I wanted to bring up is there is a um, a CrossFit chick, and she's on one of the covers. And she's more muscle than I've ever imagined any person ever have. It's insane. Uh, they also had a Paralympic, a girl missing a leg. Um, and uh, it was really cool. Like, uh, you know, th- they did a really good display of different bodies. They also do different ages and stuff, which I thought was really cool. Um, the one I wanted to mention is someone I adore. Um, a gymnast named Caitlin Ohashi. You guys probably she went viral this year with like a floor routine on Facebook. She is great. Her pictures are insane because she's all legs and like she's just so thick, but like four two or something <laughs> stupid. Like she's really tiny, but I recommend checking them out because it's it's not even in any like I said in kind of a sexual way. It's right. just fascinating to see bodies. And plus, the Philadelphia Eagle offensive line is in there together. And they're all just standing in a line holding things over their dicks, basically. And um, one of the dudes is holding something over one of his friend's dicks so he doesn't have to hold it for himself. Bro, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, so, yeah, that's pretty much what I read. Um, so I want to pass it over to Jesse and see what he read this week. All right. So uh, I'm almost done with World War Z. Um, I think next week will be the last time I cover it. I'll, that's when I'll be finishing up the book. Um, and this week I thought I had found my favorite story where one of the guys who was in Japan referred to him as like an otaku and how he survived. Like He didn't even notice that his parents were already gone for like his only complaint was like that his mom wasn't making him sandwiches and stuff the whole time. He was uh, someone that was stuck on the computer the whole time, right? 
And then all of a sudden, like, you notice people on the computer started dying out. It's like, where where did all the followers go? And where are all these people? And that's when the zombies started hitting and everything. Anyway, I thought that was going to be my story. It's not. The one I like the most is actually they jumped. I got to it today. So I was already ready to gung-ho and to go over the other one. And then today I got to a story with uh, the canines. So they ended up making like a made like a big unit made up of nothing but people who were trained with their dog partners and so they had they had these dogs like trained to the T to help them fight like this giant zombie war man so they it's like since pups it talks about how they they would lock they would put the the like the puppies in one room and in that same room like but with separated by a little mesh fence was all the zombies on the other side so they like they trained them to know how to sniff them and how to like not necessarily fight them because even if they bite any of the flesh of the zombies the dogs would die they, they, they'd be done so these dogs were trained to go out on the line and they would do they had like they knew how to like tactically have the zombies like avoid either their partner or how to get all of them to line up and stuff they would go out there and start barking and have the zombies start following them at first it was just like one quick bark and then they would lead like whatever zombies came the dogs started to learn and develop so the dogs would bark and then just they knew that they could just stay a couple feet away and they'd be fine so they kept barking to bring as many of them as they could and then they would just like start popping all the zombies like the the their army partner would be waiting and when the dogs would bring them, they would just start popping all the zombies in the head and stuff. So the dogs were like an instrumental, instrumental like part of like this massive attack that they were having. And the dudes were talking about how they didn't really take the connection that they had with the dogs into consideration, like the rest of the military didn't. So they weren't they wouldn't let them take care of them properly. Uh, one of them had suggested that they should put like a little, like a little explosive in the collar just in case. There's a situation where they know that they might not make it, so they and they said that it's it wasn't an expense that was worth it. It's not worth spending the money for it. It's just you know something, something dumb like that. And uh, there was this one chick who, like her partner, the the dog, fell into this hole, and the disease were coming towards him. So she got her rifle and started heading towards her, and because he was getting in her way he shot the du- she shot the dude in the mouth like 12 she emptied like half a clip into it, this dude's mouth so she could go get her dog and of course like she was tackled by the MPs and unfortunately the dog did end up getting surrounded by the zombies and getting killed uh, and oh, then they hung her they gave her a public execution they hung her uh, yeah yeah to make a, an example out of her and keep in mind these are all fucking like interviews with one journalist the journalist and they're explaining everything that fucking happened. Um, I can't like tell you guys how awesome it is. It's so different from the movie. The it's it, the movie basically literally. Uh, I was talking to Josue about this yesterday. The the movie just has the title. That's all it has. Nothing else has anything to do with the book at all. Except yeah, I was so let down by the movie because my the same thing. Like the book is one of my favorites, and it's nothing. They could have been so much better. Yeah. It could have been so much better. Uh, I was telling Josue that I really would have Brad Pitt just change his personality and have multiple ones and do this, all, all the different stories. I was like, I would have been okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> just have right, him be right. every single character. I was like, all right, I'm down. Uh, He's the but, zombie uh, hunting dog. Yes. <laughs> yes. Or I'm just uh, at the otaku dude from Japan and just like, yes. be super right. racist. <laughs> 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 or like the parachute chick, he's there's, in a parachute. There's a story in there where they're yes. talking about a feral child. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, right now, I'm also on the story with a, a surfer dude who they would go down into the water and start like to do some repairs on some machinery and stuff. But they would be like in these awesome like metal like kind of suits, like almost like I, I was picturing mechs, but they were like in armor. Uh, with all kinds of stuff. Uh, anyway, yeah, no, the dog story was awesome. Uh, that that one's the one that really stood out to me this time around. Um, if I could recommend it, like I totally would. Like just read the book, man. Such a good book. Uh, 
the other thing I read is I did read chapter four, uh, Vigilantes, the My Hero Academia spinoff. <laughs> um, and this time around, it goes to the crawler who used to be Gentleman. Uh, just going back to his apartment, right? Uh, he has his apartment on top of this like abandoned like apartment building that looks like it's falling apart. And it's like a little shed on top of it. But it's it's like a, the way that it was advertised was like a, it's a deluxe apartment. And then when he got in there, it's, it was all shitty. But he, he cleaned it up. It looks nice now. Um, and it's, you could tell that he was kind of lonely. But when he walked into his apartment, there was like a random dude with like a massive scar in his face, like drinking his beer, eating his food, watching TV. He's like, yo, man, like you're almost out of beer. He's like, uh, and so he starts calling 911. And then he puts on the mask, and it's the old guy that you know he calls Master. He's like, oh, Master, it's you. Uh, what are you doing in my house? And then as he's chilling in the house, um, the, the girl shows up, and now apparently everyone's just living there now. Uh, and they're just they're rolling with it, so that that's what's going on. And uh, the chick prepares herself because she's a pop idol, so she gets herself dressed up and stuff. Her room is separated now by curtains, and he's wondering where the hell she curtains. Um, and my favorite part was I think where he asked the old man like, "How'd you even get in? Like the door was locked, right?" And he's like, "Oh, I just let myself in through the window." And then it shows the picture of the window, and the window's broken. So, <laughs> Uh, so he's like, ah, yeah, I see you let yourself in. <laughs> and uh, he, so he's like, you can, he's like, I'm just going to leave this spare key here. He's like, oh, I don't need it. It's like, please, please use the spare key. Uh, and it, the, the girl goes to go do her concert. One of the fanboys gets too crazy and he pops the drug, gets all crazy monsterish. And he's like a slimy salamanderish looking thing. And he's like, oh, I just want to shake your hand. So she's running away like gross. And uh, they tell her, like, you know what? Maybe he'll calm down if you uh, if you just shake his hand. Because they tried to punch this thing and everything, but his skin was too slippery because <laughs> it was covered in mucus. Um, so they're like, well, you know, just shake his hand. Maybe it'll calm him down. So she shakes his hand, and then he goes like, oh, no, I need a hug. Kiss me. And, like, wraps her around and almost goes into a technical point, but it doesn't. And... <laughs> Uh, as he's getting ready to like uh, force make out with her, uh, the other guys uh, hit her with uh, hit them with flour, so it gets attached all to the mucus and stuff. And then the old man just beats the crap out of him, of course, as he usually does. And the other thing was uh, when they were when they were telling her to just shake his hand and yeah, just let him touch your butt while you're at it. I mean, you got enough of it to go around. Uh, so good times all around. Um, but yeah, that was Vigilantes for this chapter. Uh, Wolverine and Cyclops make another appearance. Not their actual name, but come on. It's it's Wolverine and Cyclops. What do they call themselves? I don't... They don't have given a name. They just call them... Oh. Okay. <laughs> but I it's very... It's very myself. clearly Cyclo- Cyclops, and it's very clearly Wolverine. <laughs> I keep having to remind myself that you're talking about a My Hero spinoff and not a One Punch Man spinoff. <laughs> <laughs> yes, My Hero, not a One Punch Man. Uh... I do, I do need to start reading the next chapters of One Punch Man. I've been letting them build up because I don't like just being all caught up with One Punch Man because then I want to keep reading. Uh, but that's what I read. Awesome. Uh, manga's really weird, guys. Like, <laughs> anytime Jesse describes a manga, I'm like, this is like a fever dream. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly how every manga... Well, because, like, Vigilante like, has more of a One Punch Man tone than it has, like, a My Hero tone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Vigilante's is not my hero at all so if you're if you want to read my hero you should read my hero because there are plenty of those chapters <laughs> yeah all right uh what about you thomas what have you been reading bam, bam, bam. so <laughs> i want to talk about fables real quick because i'm not going to yeah. talk too much about it <laughs> real quick so so <laughs> you guys i told you guys about um the little short story about jack and the civil war and death and all that so we did yeah. that and then there was this next other short story before we got to like the real good stuff about the reporter that thought everybody in Fable Town Town was vampires and they they got <laughs> rid of him. So we moved on from that. And all I gotta say about the main storyline is fuck Bluebeard man. <laughs> He's such a dick. I don't like him at all. I 
And you know what? I shouldn't even be surprised that he was hiding Goldilocks because he fucking would. And of course, <laughs> they were doing naughty things. But honestly, dude, like, this volume, or this story, I should say, like, further blossomed Snow White and Big B's relationship, and I loved it. And she's fucking pregnant! That's all I gotta say! <laughs> what? There's a baby! <laughs> <laughs> there's a baby. <laughs> there's a baby and, involved. Yes, there is a baby. <laughs> and that's all I'm gonna say until hey, I read more. Thomas. Yes. Thomas. Um, please just pay attention. Just cherish those moments when um, Boy Blue, uh, Fly Catcher, and Pinocchio are just fine comics. <laughs> when they're just when they're just rolling around. It's when they're just rolling around. Just cherish those, please. Just, I will. just take a moment. Uh-huh. Okay. Just take a moment. You guys are scaring me. <laughs> it's so. Yeah. I love them so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just like, I just love them so much. Oh, you know? okay. I thought it was like, cherish them because they're going to fucking end. <laughs> no, bro, let's go back to the baby. Uh, what else did you get to? <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That's, that, that was the last thing. But, yeah, I'll find out more. I, I don't have a way to read volume four right now, so I have to hunt it down. Um, because Kendall cut me off. They only had the two first two volumes. They didn't have volume three. And... I will have to find a way to read it, but I will. I had to read it for free online this week, and it was kind of annoying. But... I have, um, remember the database I showed you? Oh, that's right. Yeah, you should send them I, to me. I have through, like, 119, I think. Oh, so. sweet. Yeah, that'll yeah. get me through, because these covered, <laughs> like, I think it hasn't even made it to 20. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one I want to talk about is I did read both issues of Curse of the White Knight and man, that is some sexy ass shit. Oh, bro, yeah. It was, it completely started like not how I expected. So like at first glance, they put you in the 1600s and you're at Arkham Manor and you see Edmund Wayne, who I can assume is Bruce's ancestor by the last name. And this dude is basically Zorro in all his glory, man. <laughs> and if that's not good enough, he's fighting fucking vampires. It was so cool. Or, and, like, the, who the villain is. It's like, I'm not sure if there's, like, yeah, vampires or, like, um, a different take on the Joker. But it's, right. um... Yeah, I can see um, that. Laffy Arkham. Or what was his whole name? <laughs> yeah, Laffy. <laughs> that's Laff- how, that's Laff- how I pronounce it. Laffy Arkham. <laughs> It's so stupid, but it works. <laughs> yeah. So then they take us back right where White Knight left off. And obviously Napier is gone, without a doubt. And we have the Joker back up to his schemes. And I like how Batman is still like kind of struggling with the aftermath. Losing oh, yeah. Alfred. Losing his reputation and like just everything he just went through and he can't even catch his breath because now the Joker's back and he wants to fuck with him so overall I'm not gonna go too too far into it but I love the character designs in this one and although unexpected I really like this whole like backtrack to the 1600s and where they're going because I didn't I didn't really didn't eh, can't speak I really didn't care how they ended White Knight, so I'm glad they're continuing it, and I hope they give it justice. How about that Harley Quinn, though? <laughs> There's a baby! <laughs> There's a baby! <laughs> oh, God. Harley Quinn is also pregnant. <laughs> so, yeah, so Jack Napier left um, Harley Quinn pregnant, but as how the Joker very clearly puts it, like, Jack and Joker are two very, very separate and different people just stuck in one body. Yeah. So, will the Joker come back for this baby since he technically really shouldn't care for it? Or will he want it for his own schemes? Yeah, I loved how... I'm really excited for how how this is going to turn out. How touchy hearing Jack's name was to the Joker. Like... Oh, man. Like, he hates him. Like, he hates himself. (laughs) It was so crazy. I loved it. But, yeah. Yeah, Harley's pregnant. I um I read that part, and Kristen was laying next to me reading Spider Gwen, and she looks over, and she's like, "Who's that?" I was like, "It's Harley Quinn." I was that like, shocked the she, hell out of me too. I think the baby's pregnant. like, "What?" <laughs> she's like, "Man, that's gonna be a fucked up baby." <laughs> it's awesome though. Um, I definitely recommend you guys give it a shot. And then 
I did read Absolute Carnage number one. Mm. They had nice. I think they had number. It was up to like two or three, but I only picked up the mm. first one because I wanted to see if I liked it. And it was pretty cool. So, like, um, what's it called? All you really need to know in regards to the story is a cult is resurrecting Carnage, and now he's on a mission to like build an army and get like all the power to this like god named Noel. I've never heard of him. I don't know if he's like been referenced before. That's the dude who I was talking about the Silver Surfer is fighting in uh, oh. Silver Surfer Black. Well, this guy no. looks badass. Yeah, dude, he's fucking crazy. Um, but yeah, so he's like going through like through all these through like history and like getting all these hosts and he's just like collecting symbiotes getting stronger and in the meantime spider-man and venom are trying to like stop him but they're really not putting up much of a fight right now but honestly dude like what drew me was was the cover because the art looked so freaking cool and it doesn't disappoint like i've never read a carnage comic i read edge of the venomverse and then i read venomverse Mm-hmm. And I'm on X Men Blue right now to finish off like that arc, and I think it's like Poison X. Poison X, yeah. Yeah, so I'm still working on that, but man, so actually, you're not that far off on like how that builds up to this. Yeah, no. I, I read those too. Um. So yeah, no, I'm working my way through. Um, I probably will pick those up as soon as I can get my hands on them. Again, I don't know how to find comics as good as you guys. But one day, I will finish it. Yeah, hey, you off a great start, buddy. Yeah, dude. No, this was actually a lot of fun. Um, I already put in the other issues for the whole order in my <laughs> subscription box. Um, but it was actually, like, fun. And, like, just to see, like, how chaotic everything is with, like, Carnage. It was, like, super cool to, like, just sit there and enjoy it. And, like, when they do, like, the full page art. Ugh candy so good um but other than that what else can i say about this i don't think i have anything else to say about it read it oh there is a bunch of little subplots i think there's subplots so there's like absolute carnage the avengers um i know the ghost rider one just came out i think today and then there's like a bunch of little different ones there's one with like iron fist I don't know if... I know they're all related in some way. I just don't know how. And I don't know if I have to read them all, but... They usually kind of spin off, like... So it'll be, like, Absolute Carnage number three. And something will happen there that'll... Like, something will happen to that Iron Fist. Okay, so... And, and then it'll start that series just to get that detail. Instead of, instead of spending too much time on the main run, you can gotcha. just get those three issues. So it's, like, a little side story and it gets, like, yeah. referenced in the main story. Okay, that makes sense. Um, the Ghost Rider one looked really cool. Um, I, I was going based off of the covers. I picked up the Avengers one because I've never read an Avengers comic. But when it comes out, or if it's in my box already, I will read it. And then I read Invincible. So the last thing I read. <laughs> yes. Dude, it was such a... It's, it wasn't like a big book, but like for comics, like it combining like the first like five issues, I think it was. I was like, there's no way I'm going to read this, like, in one day. And I read it in, like, 30 minutes. I was like, holy <laughs> shit. When I least expected it, I was already on the last pages. And I don't know mm-hmm. how to explain it. So, like, so like you have Mark Grayson and his family. And then, like, they just casually reveal that his dad is, like, basically Superman. And <laughs> <laughs> a few pages later, he starts to develop his own powers. And I just love that one page where he wants to know if he can fly and he just like jumps off he's like if my other powers haven't developed i'm not sure if i can fly and he's like fuck it <laughs> he just jumps <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um yeah he seems pretty adept um, you know probably coming from like his father being such a like famous superhero he turns out to be kind of a badass and the first thing he has to deal with is his crazy ass teacher turning all his students into bombs and just yeah. like Boston bombing everything and he meets a teen brigade <laughs> which the teen, uh. the teen brigade reminds me of um, 
I don't know why every time I see them, they reminds me of the Vindicators from Rick and Morty. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. Because their names are terrible. Probably. It's duplicate, just... <laughs> Rex, Blow, <laughs> and <God>. Weave. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's cheesy, but it, it works. Everything in this comic, whatever it is, kind of everything put together just worked so well. And then they had the little subplot about his dad being kidnapped and taken to another dimension. And it just, like, my favorite part has to be how monotone and, like, nonchalant the mom is about everything. Yes. She's like, just nothing phases her. <laughs> yeah, she's like, it, so Mark runs to his mom and he's like, hey, dad got kidnapped by aliens. She's like, well, I guess he's not going to make it for dinner. <laughs> and then, like, she, she, like, there was this one point where, like, they actually show, like, some emotion come out of her where she's, like, slightly worried. And, but then she says some crazy shit, like, well, I always get worried when he goes off to another dimension. <laughs> it's so stupid. But and when I he loved comes it. back. When he just walks in, and he has a beard, and he just like, I need to shave. <laughs> yeah. Like it's just such a normal thing to him. It's like so grounded. It was, it's gorgeous. I loved it. I had so much fun reading it. Um, but yeah, volume two will come next week. Awesome. All right, uh, let's pass on to Dog. How you doing, man? Do we have T Dog? We do. We oh, awesome. we do. My computer was acting up for a second. Sorry about that. <laughs> so I uh, really only read one thing this week. I don't know if you guys have ever read it, but I'm reading uh, the series uh, from Image Comics. Uh, what was it again? Say it again. Created. I'm sorry? What was the series again? Say it again. Uh, Damn it. <laughs> I'm sorry. For some reason, a computer is pulling up images of other comic books. I think you're being edited by your internet connection. Yeah. Major Tom, this is you guys Ground Control. Are... Major Tom, this is Ground Control. Yeah, we got you, man. What was the name of it okay. again? So, reading uh, Rumble, you guys ever read it? Oh, no. Okay, just to, I like it, so this is the first four series, uh, but I had to put it down through the other issues, and I regretted it ever since. Oh, it's so uh, good. So yeah, it's it really good. Comics. It is so dope. So, all right, so Image Comics, uh, created by co-creators John um, Arcudi and James Heron. Uh, art by Dave Stewart, and it is amazing. Uh, basically, the premise of it is this uh, guy's just your average, everyday loser, you know, average Joe, tanning bar. Um, you know, he's at work one night uh, with one of his regulars, and they're just shooting the shit. And all of a sudden, a scarecrow kicks in the door and chops off his regular's arm, and then the guy disappears. So, the premise is there is an ancient god who is trapped in the scarecrow's body, who is seeking revenge against this old demon race that used to run the earth, and it is freaking phenomenal. If you guys get a chance to read it, I'm reading the uh, the trades right now, so I have the first three, and so far the story is amazing. So basically, um, the way the earth was set up is every race has their time, and then when their time ends, it's time for a new age to begin. So before the age of man, there was this group of kind of demons that kind of ruled monsters that ruled the earth, and the main character named Rathak, um, his goal or he was basically charged with the gods to wipe out these monsters to make room for man to take over the earth. So he did that, and then was betrayed and kind of kept prisoner for thousands of years, and now he's back for revenge. Um, his spirit is inhabiting the scarecrow who wields a gigantic sword called Thunder Chop. And it is all kinds of awesome, man. If you guys have a chance to see it, the art is amazing. It's super action-oriented, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So the art, I mean, go panel to panel, and this guy, uh, the artist uh, Dave Stewart, just knows how to draw action. Um, I love the character design. If you get to any part where there's a fight, it's very visceral. You, you know, It just flows off the page. And the story is actually really interesting, too. Um, if you get a chance to read it, I highly recommend Rumble. Uh, Image Comics, you will not be disappointed. Yeah. That, that sounds really interesting. You pretty much sold me on that. Well, yeah, what's, the, what's the theme on the Paul Bunyan? <laughs> Do you want to take... Okay, so... <laughs> so there is a place called Paul Bunyan Land that's, you know, kind of this abandoned theme park in the city. And that's where all of these, you know, kind of demon creatures kind of gather. 
Um, they're not supposed to be on Earth, so they're kind of in hiding. And there's just this huge fallen statue of Paul Bunyan that's always there throughout the comic. So as the comic progresses, you know, the scenes has changed, so <laughs> it's covered in snow. At one point, somebody sets the statue on fire, and the main character, <laughs> Rothak, is, is convinced he's like an old god that he, he can't quite understand why humans pay such disrespect to their god, <laughs> Paul Bunyan. It's it's so dope. You guys got to read it. <laughs> that's awesome. All right. Uh, well, uh, but yeah, that's all I got this week, man. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, let's wrap it up as always with House Sway. Hey. Um, so, I have uh, like a set schedule, like what I'm reading, and since it's Spider Month, it was gonna be Spider Month. It was still is. And then Keith reminded me uh, yesterday that, or the day before that, Loki was gonna come out. So I had set I had set myself reminders because I knew other stuff was gonna come out that day too. That I've been reading like the Silver Surfer Black Four, Sonata Four, and like Thumbs Number Four. Um, and then I get to the store and I'm walking around, and then there was also Coffin Bound Two, Man Eaters Eleven. This is the one that I'm reading, Sea of Star, or I haven't read, but I'm going to Sea of Stars. Right. I got that one too, and then King Thor. I had no idea it already come out. So I was like, holy shit, I can't talk about all of this. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> it's way too much. But I'm glad that this, right. all this, all the stuff that I've talked about here is is building. Um, but uh, what I what I did end up getting or still got was uh, that Miles Morales Spider Man number ten or Legacy the two fifty. Um, oh man, I actually really that one. I read a bit of that. Yeah, and I love when Peter is like, "Man, this happened," and I was worried I won't have time, and then I was like, "Wait, I could dump this on Miles." Dude, that was so fucking funny. Just like, bro, it's like I don't care. Shake it off. Like, I, I left this part of the city for a reason. Like, get like, to it. Yours, man. <laughs> it was great. Yeah, it was like, I, like I like that. There's these moments where like you think you know where these two dudes stand. Like, there's so many times where Peter has been like, no, you shouldn't be Spider-Man over his responsibility. That just like so he wouldn't feel guilty over like another dude taking a spot, and it's just like copying him just feels weird about that but then he pre- obviously Miles proves himself and the later is like yeah. yeah you can be Spider-Man but that was, then he gets that moment was straight out of like Spider-Verse like, yeah I, but then there's moments <laughs> where now now we're in a spot where like Peter's just comfortable enough to be like just to just dump shit on him now <laughs> um but yeah, yeah there's a, a dude uh, ultimatum I assume it's from the ultimate universe I thought he was on yeah cause there's the event called ultimatum uh, but uh, that was Magneto that was the main villain yeah, for that. I don't remember a character named Ultimatum. He's actually Miles Morales from the Spider-Man 2 uh, short story, or short run. Oh. And yeah, he's he's basically, yeah, Earth 616 Miles Morales, where he, he's not more, uh, he doesn't look more black, he looks more uh, Mexican or Latino yeah. um, on, uh, on, the, on the 616. And from the looks of it, his suit is just like a cross between almost all the Avengers. But I don't know; he's weird. And he brought back, he brought over um, Ultimate Green Goblin, um, and it was just like his birthday issue. It was a pretty good setup on where's where's to go. I have Spider Man. I need to reread Spider Man Two over again just to get a, his whole backstory. But then now we got to the sweet spot of Spider Month, starting at. Uh, starting out with the legacy run like it's pretty much just going to be starting out with like the legacy runs and it's nick spencer taking over spider-man oh my god the reign of dan slot is finally over after so many years <laughs> like i can talk so much shit about it because i have most of his run from like superior spider-man and on forward why i stayed on it it was i mean i just had to know what was going to happen with spider-man and also, if I was going to talk shit, I was going to have, like, know what I was talking about. And God damn it, there was just, like, so much missing feeling in his run over, like, eight years. And then we get Nick Spencer, and the first issue alone was just so much more than what I ever wanted. Who, Which is actually drawn, like, this new creative team is Ryan Otley, if I'm saying that word right? The Invincible yeah, Artist. Yeah, I think that's right, yeah. It's the Invincible artist, so it's like cool. Yeah. I never, I never read Invincible, but now I get to kind of look at it, and it is probably some of the best um, Spider-Man like I've seen in a long time. Like I, I would love, I, I do put this up with uh, Ryan Stegman. I really like the way he does. Probably maybe my favorite Spider-Man artist. Hmm. I have to think about it. 
I really Ooh. have to think about it, right? Because Ryan Stegman can get these sweet Spider-Man like panels that that resemble the Capcom Sp- Captain Marvel video game Spider-Man. Right, right. Um, but anyway, Nick Spencer pretty much like pulls the rug from everything that Dan Slott did for Peter, <laughs> almost everything, and it's great. We have we have this <laughs> Peter again who's just like struggling from almost the beginning. Um, at this point, he had his own business and he had to sell it. It, go, it went bankrupt. Or it just went down. Um, so now he's pretty much like the science editor over at the Daily Bugle and he's like, he's got a really great position. Um, except for his living situation, he's living with um, Robbie Robertson's like nephew and, sh- and mm-hmm. also with Boomerang. Uh, but obviously they don't know, but he does know that he's Boomerang. Yeah, I saw some comics with them being roommates. Yeah, it's yeah. it's pretty funny. He's just like completely taking advantage and just like eating all their food and just being a dick. <laughs> That's great. Um, let's see. Kingpin offers Spider Man like the key to the city, only to like alienate him with everyone. Pretty much like with Daredevil, like pretty much all of his friends. Um, yeah. At one point, Peter goes to cover a story. There's like a new tech, like a plagiarism tech, messed with like Cerebro tech. Um, and he gets he, Peter gets called out to kind of use it on him, and he gets frauded. Like his paper, they, they use his pa- the the paper that Otto wrote for it because yeah, Peter dropped out of college, and that never became a thing. So when Otto took over, he that kind of brought it. He brought that up again and finished school for him, but it was written in like pretty much nice. in Otto's words. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, his academics got all his, uh, his degree got revoked and thus got fired from the bugle. Um, this is just having a shit day. There's like this weird bug invasion. Um, <laughs> there's this hilarious moment where like Daredevil's giving him like the silent treatment and then uh, uh, Johnny fucking a um, the human torch rolls up and like quotes Star Wars to him. He's like, he doesn't like you. And he's like, dude, not now. <laughs> and he's like, I don't like you either. Dude, I mean it. Not now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he figures out that it's like this not a super random pattern or like whatever this bug thing is happening. Almost has this like weird existential cr- moment where he's gonna sacrifice himself, and it's like a big orb in the sky, and it's like Mysterio. Um, yeah, puts him down. Um, yeah, and then Peter has to go back to the school to for have like his academics like reviewed or whatever. And he gets a he gets a shot as a second for a second chance at school through mm-hmm. a class taught by Kurt Connors, the lizard. Yeah. And so yeah, Pete freaks out. The lizard tells him like it's cool. Like he reverts back from like the lizard to Kurt Connors and shows him that he's got an inhibitor chip. So we'll see how well that goes. <laughs> um, and are, have you been reading uh, Ghost Spider? Do you know the new Spider Gwen at all? No. Do you know what's going on in that comic? No, no. What's what's going on? Okay, so you know she's not from the six one six universe, obviously. Yeah. yeah. So they wanted her in the six one six universe, so they came up with a story where her secret identity got outed on her world, and uh, so she can't live a normal life, and she wants to go to college. So she actually got permission to come to the six one six universe to attend college. So she's going to Empire State, where Connors is teaching. Like interesting. Oh, yeah. Look, look over those pages. See if she's off in the background. Then, yeah, it's kind of interesting because like she's coming over there. They've mentioned Connors a couple times, and you know, in her origin, the lizard is uh, Peter in her world, and he oh, ended I up thought dying. Pe- I thought, I th- yeah, I thought Peter was like her Gwen, or that's why how it happened. Yeah, exactly. So he ended up dying in there, but he basically, if I remember correctly, he tried to give himself powers after she got powers. Oh, okay. And turned himself into the lizard, and he ended up dying in the process. So, there's like a weird connection between her and Kurt Connors, because he's the lizard in this world, and Peter's the lizard over there, and like, it's gonna be really interesting. I wonder if that, how much it's gonna cross over. Right, I'm very curious, too. I, I'm gonna check out, see if she is like, off in the background, almost like, she'll probably, I wonder if she'll pop up like, in, into the Spider-Verse, and have to play out <laughs> like that. Yeah. Um, so let's see. So, yeah, um, wants to offer him a, he wants to offer Pete a second chance, like over like the plagiarism thing. Just like, bro, just start over. Like, I don't care what the explanation is. Like, like you've done so much for me like, over the years. Like, it's the least I can do. And he shows him that they're working with the isotope genome accelerator. 
the thing that gave him like the powers in the first place. Right. Um, and he kind of wants to use it to kind of splice out the lizard in him, and then Taskmaster and Black Cat like crashing the crashing the joint to just be dicks, pretty much. <laughs> and the Taskmaster knocks Pete back um, into the machine, then distracts them with like a chemical reaction, like a smoke bomb. Mm -hmm. um, and so Spider Man shows up and saves the day, and then helps Peter up. When he, yeah, it's um, not like a clone saga, but mm -hmm. so when he got pushed into like the the machine, the that same machine, it split him into two, like one Peter and one Spider Man. Not this, yeah, like a little different. So with no powers, no powers to do the job, but there's still a Spider Man, like like him, like it leaves him to kind of almost be like a comfortable life, like dates with M MJ and just yeah, just have a life. Yeah, there's a moment where Spe Peter fights uh, the Tri Sentinel, like yeah, the the old robot. Right. Um. Yeah, Peter has to see. Oh yeah, Peter has to see like Connors again. Tells him that they've gone with like with animal testing, the with the machine, and mm -hmm. tells him that it splits it splits the subject with like one having like the superior traits and the other having like just like the petty leftovers. <laughs> Basically, like in Rick and Morty, like, like, the Rick toxin and Morty yeah, like the toxin episode. <laughs> So it's Everything Pete is, goes back to Pete is yeah Pete is powerless and dumb and pirate and so Pi Spider Man hacks the fucking Tri Sentinel and uses it to pretty much quote unquote save the day as he's done mm -hmm. a wreck like he has like none of the responsibility. Um, it's revealed that this dude Mendelstrom um, sent the the robot. It was like it was under it would be like a he bought it but it was like super shoddy because he didn't have like all the codes to it. Mm. it Why well, it was hackable. Um, yeah, SP can't help but watch to save the day um, while he meets uh, who is it? Yeah, so Pete, yeah, you know, we want Spider Man is meeting like basketball players, being on The View. He's actually getting endorsement deals and Pete's just living <laughs> a shit life. Uh, May tells Pete that it's fine, like, like she just expects more. She's still like super disappointed over like the plagiarism thing. Um, Pete talks to Spider Man to like chill out, like don't go so crazy like mm -hmm. doesn't he remember like uncle ben and he's like who <laughs> <laughs> remembers nothing like so p goes to connor's again like then then reveals to him that the rats have died because of the split um uh oh yeah so uh oh um then strom gets like a whole arsenal of like tri, tri sentinels from this is like a mystery dude who's like it's like a it's like a new player, a new villain who's kind of making a big, big play. Um, he had this thing with Mysterio, and now he kind of—he's the one that gave him the arsenal. Um, so Pete tricks, uh, tricks, he tricks Boomerang to stealing like the machine, only for him to kind of steal it from him because he's just dumb. <laughs> he sets up to kind of zap Spider-Man so they can just like go back to normal when the Armada shows up, um, and then like that mysterious bug guy, he just has like this like giant millipede. Like almost like Voldemort with the Nagini, and yeah. he kills he kills Strom like just like for whatever. Um, so Pete and Spider Man make a run for it. He's not even zip like webbing away. They're just both making a run for it. It's like, aren't you supposed to like save like like do something? It's like why save a couple of tourists and die for it when I can just come back and save it later? Like whatever. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm sorry. I'm gonna put up this uh, pull up this one moment. Um, because uh, the the sentinel like is about to zap him. Oh my god! I can't find the fucking issue. It, um, and Peter just like pushes Spider Man out of the way and uh, fucking and then the saving Spider Man. And it's like fuck it. If this is the way I go out, then it's the way I go out. Like at least like uh, at least like uh, I would make Uncle Ben proud. <laughs> and Spider Man finally brings it up after all these years. Like, see, there you go again. Like. Why do you keep bringing up this delicious brand of instant rice? <laughs> you know what? And then, and then hold Spider Man. Like, you know what? It doesn't matter. This moment on, I will be known as Peter Man, avenging all mediocre men who have never strived for anything in their lives. Excellent. <laughs> it's so good. Um, so Peter's just like, fuck it. I guess nothing's going to change. And just like drops the whole machine on them and like reverse them back into one. But as they're doing it, Spider-Man is the one that tells Peter, like, to also just, like, chill the fuck out. Like, after all these troubles, we're still fucking Spider-Man. Like, who gives a shit, like, what's going on? 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Spider Man realized, like, okay, they hack into one, so they can just, like, rework the network to hack into all of them and then take the fight to where Mendelstrom is. And then when they get there, like, all the robots and then even, even like, the body's just, like, saying, guess my name, guess my name, over and over. And then the whole thing explodes. Huh. And then it gets to a shot where, like, Craven is also making a play somewhere else. Somewhere else. And that was the first arc. Mm. Like, I was really, really a big fan of, like, Otley. Because then we get into arc two, and then enter fucking Umberto Ramos' art. Oh, I love him. <laughs> ah, I'm so tired of him. <laughs> he comes and goes in Spider-Man, and it's just like... He's like how Tom put it. Like, he's like that, that action style. Uh-huh. But I'm just so tired of it, to be honest. He had a really good run in X-Men that I really liked. Um, when, uh... Oh, man. I'm trying to remember, like, anything. Um, it, it was just a really good run. I love his drawing, mm-hmm. how he draws. I just really like how he draws Iceman. Sometimes it's just, yeah. like, how do like, big faces where it's just, like... I don't know. It's too showy for me sometimes. Like, I, it's just like I've been so over at Ramos for a while. It's like almost like Ramada Jr. I can only handle, take, like, I'll read him now sometimes depending on what the story's about. Yeah. I, used to be, I used to be excited for both of these dudes, but now it's just like, I just moved on with other artists. Yeah. But, There's a lot of and, new young artists, which, yeah. Like, Especially exactly Ramita. Like, like, Ramita's been forever. Yeah. Like, or even like Ramos, too. Like, like he's done spider-man a lot like there was a good thing starting out like it's what bugs me about marvel like they just change it almost every other arc where like have like ryan otley like go at it for like at least two arcs or even three arcs if there's if this is really the creative team that we're going for you know but now yeah let's just let's just switch over instantly on the, on the second arc and just like almost like push me away but I, still, I, I, I was still just like in it because nick spencer really is doing a fantastic job with peter yeah. um so at this point it's like shit sucks at home um with boomerang he's just like still hit he's like hitting on mj while they're just like on the couch um and so but then he convinces uh he later convinces pete to go out with him uh to a bar after he says like he knows a lot about spider-man and it's a bar with no name like the villain bar for trivia night for trivia night <laughs> and there's there's, and there's like a spider-man trivia night and so they so they can just like win the pot um so boomerang yeah so yeah they're doing like pete knows everything he's getting every answer right and they're gonna win so boomerang kind of ditches him is gonna yeah calls uh fucking kingpin because he was kind of working for him uh tells him to kind of almost like fuck off or like pay me double or something and so kingpin just like you know fuck boomerang put the hand on him at the bar um at in the at the end of it boomerang saves pete and because Pete had obviously had to hold back, not not to reveal himself. Kira. Uh, there's a part where uh, they kind of flashes over to what Boomerang's doing in his personal life because Pete Spider-Man followed him for a second. Yeah, and it's just sad because Boomerang has no friends. He was part of like the superior foes of Spider-Man, but I guess in, at the end of that run, Boomerang kind of like fucked over everybody uh, to work for the Pete Kingpin. So he hired the Tinker to make LMDs of all of these foes to kind of have like a poker night, and it's just super fucking sad that he's just so alone. Aww. Um, so Pete feels sorry for him. Um, almost maybe he's maybe turning around anti-hero. Nice. And then so Kingpin Kingpin puts another hit on on them, like on like the whole apartment. He was literally using Kingpin's money to to use to pay for rent for the sublet. Um, when the mysterious bug guy shows up out of nowhere and tells him to like hey leave the roommate alone like he's he's off limits and makes him kneel for it like shows him like his dead wife Vanessa how he can maybe bring her back too and so now Kingpin's like working for him um let's see I believe that was the yeah that was the end of that arc I was just like just like fuck it and then the next one or you know it still goes into Ramos but the story moves on where like all the supers around like everywhere losing like their power their weapons um let's see black cat saves spidey from a fall because he lost his web shooters and black cat knows who's doing this and helps him out for it as long as she gets like half of it like all the weapons um mj meets with carly Hmm. cooper and at this point i'm noticing that there's like a trend like nick spencer's like bringing in like a bunch of like c and d list like people like him going back with mj after all of these years like boomerang being a thing cindy lawton the 
Man, Man Mountain Marco, who's like this old ass villain, <laughs> along with the Ringer, like the Tricet, and all. Like I said, Mendel Strom yeah. was actually this old dude that used to work for, I think for JJ. Or if I'm getting that wrong, um, that's Carly Cooper, who used to date Spider Man. There's like the this like hippo mutant dude. Um, Arcade is gonna make a play soon. Like the Enforcers, Scorpion, and then like this uh, this dude called the Big Man. Yeah, and yeah. so he's he's bringing out like all of these like old dudes that nobody has talked about forever, and it's just like making the story better. Um, so anyway, so MJ meets with Carly Cooper and tells her about the lookups, which is basically this like AA meeting for not an AA meeting, but uh, an anonymous group where the people who know people with supers can just go and talk about their problems without with actually being anonymous. Yeah, and it's, a, and it's actually run by Jarvis and like. Um, like with Stark Tech and Doctor Strange like spells and stuff to actually make it legit. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, so Black Hat explains that it's like the Thieves Guild which is doing all this whole thing, and the day is saved when Spider Man notices uh, Miss Marvel's bag and gets her fo- pretty much gets her phone and pings it on alert because everybody's been looking for them and like they're struggling, even Tony Stark, and then. Miss Marvel says, like, oh, shit, my phone just pinged. And then it's just like, fuck, we're idiots. Um, <laughs> so then Felicia confess later, like, when they say the day is safe, Felicia confesses that the reason, like, she's been, like, going dark almost, like, all of these years is because, like, something's, like, been bothering her. And that she remembers that she doesn't remember. Um, and so Pete reveal- reveals himself to her. Like, tells him, like, hey, it's Pete. It's me. And so I thought it was weird but surprising. But it was one of those where, like, she was, she was either about to go, you would either go even darker or, like, this could have, like, saved her. And it really did help, like, their relationship. So then it mm-hmm. cuts, like, that mystery bug guy, and he gets, like, super pissed that um, that he included her in her circle. Like, almost like he's going to take down, like, everybody that, like, knows who he is. It's, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see who this guy is. Um, so and, then, and then there's a short story with... Um, with uh, Ryan Otley finally coming back uh, for this, like, two-parter. And then, um, yeah, a while back ago, Pete also told J. Jonah Jameson that he was Peter and also helped the relationship. <laughs> um, did you oh, wait, did you guys play uh, the Spider-Man game, how he kind of broadcasts, like, out, like he has, like, his own podcast or what, a radio yeah. show? Yeah, yeah. It's the complete opposite. He broadcasts on how much Spider-Man is a hero now. Like, because they actually know each other very personally when yeah. Aunt May married his dad. Um, Which is a great story. Yeah. <laughs> they're brothers. Uh, they're <laughs> brothers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Kingpin wants to make another play here to, ja- to jab at Spider-Man. He wants to give JJ, like, the Lifetime Achievement Award and have Spider-Man introduce them, like, on stage for it. Um, so now JJ gets all in his head about it and he puts the word out. Um, and then when Spider-Man gets there, he's pretty much just like he pretty much telling him that hey, it's not happening. I'm not doing this, just so you know. Mm-hmm. And this is and this is when the Enforcers show up, and because he has to hold back because JJ is just in the way, it's like three against one, and and so they they kidnap the, they kidnap both of them, and they both wake up and like the the arcade has um, this huge elaborate thing to kind of like fuck with JJ emotionally and like. To just show him through all the struggles, like the scorpion is there to kind of almost like to still scare him around, um, right? Yeah, and then it, and then it gets revealed, and then at the end of it, when they get to, when they get to the end of it, um, sorry, um, that's when the big man shows up, and it's Frederick Foswell, but Junior, like his son, like blames Spider Man for the death of his son. JJ reveals that. It was kind of his fault, too. Like, even though he did give him a second chance, but the dude ended up going bad anyway all those years ago. So, that that, that uh, ends up getting stopped. And then um, Taskmaster and Black Ant show up again to kidnap Scorpion. <laughs> um, and then we get to, like, the end of it. like Because I, I read through the first issue all the way to 15. It was, like, yeah, for, for part one of Peter Parker's. Right. And... The last two, god damn it, they were so good because it's a little arc for two parter called Family Matters, and drawn by Bachalo. I forget his first name. But what's really awesome about this is that ten years ago in 2009... Oh, you, you talking about Chris Bacalo? 
Vakala? Okay, I, yeah, yeah. I, I always remember it with the hard CH. I love him. He's great. Yeah, so 10 years ago in The Amazing Spider-Man, 576 and 575, I believe, he he uh, drew a two-parter Spider-Man story called also Family Ties. Oh, with Joe Kelly. How could I forget? Mm-hmm. With Joe Kelly, it was, it was also called Family Ties, and it's one of my favorite Spider-Man stories. So it was just, it was just like, I'm, yeah, it's a, a sweet coincidence that literally ten years later, there's another one, Family Ties, drawn by him, and it includes like the Rhino. It actually kind of almost ties into Miles Morales. It says it takes place right after its run of number three. Um, and this one, like Aunt May's gonna meet meet up with JJ's dad's lawyer, and pretty much like his like trust fund is like running out, and she's kind of gonna go broke soon. And then he makes like this weird play of like he hits on her, and so she's like, "Fuck this!" and like. Pretty much dumps wine all over the dude and like says and heads out, and then she, <laughs> yes, and then she sees like this homeless guy and like, okay, I'm gonna give him, I'm gonna give him a meal, and takes him back inside and makes the that lawyer pay for it all, um, and <laughs> when the whole thing is crashed by the rhino because he's being chased by a Taskmaster and Black Ant, um, and then the whole cave, the the whole building caves in, uh, yeah, of course Spider Man shows up. And, and yeah, so they save everybody except for the homeless dude. He's like the last one now after like the whole thing got caved in. And this is last dude who came out of nowhere again. This dude named Ned Leeds, who was got framed. He he was married for with Betty Brandt. They're actually rivals yeah. way back when he was actually a reporter at the Daily Bugle. He was and the then, hobgoblin. Yeah, then he got framed for the hobgoblin. He was recent- the hobgoblin. He was the, oh, okay. the hobgoblin. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, and then yeah, later on he the jackal cloned him too. So yeah. this was the real one, and after all these years, his fucked up life led him to just like be a homeless. Or I think I'm, fuck, I can't remember if it was a clone or not. I think it was a real one, but he dies in Peter's arms. Oh, wow. Um, and it kind of yeah, obviously it would hurt me because she did try to help him out, but it it kind of uh, sparked in her uh, sparked her to reopen feast. See if she can do it on her own without. I mean, obviously without the money of Martin Lee, Aww. and then, and then it ends with Crack, uh, Craven um, going to the arcade, and apparently the arcade has like the blueprints or the last remaining blueprints of that dome that was put around Earth on Secret Empire to right. put out all the heavy hitters, and mm-hmm. he wants to put a he wants to put a dome around New York City, and I believe that's the next arc. Like it's like the big arc hunted. Nice. So that's pretty much what's been going on in Spider Man's life, just for um, <laughs> just, uh, an update of the current run for Legacy. That is some nice. crazy ass shit. <laughs> yeah, I want I want more Ryan Otley for Spider Man. Don't give me Ramos. <laughs> you heard it here first. All right. I mean, yeah, you guys are reading uh, Invincible. Like, it looks amazing. Imagine that on Spider Man. Yeah, honestly, like, I, I would like to see that. Like Ramos did Impulse with Mark Wade years ago when he got his first mm-hmm. comic, and I love that comic. So I have this, he has my love. So, Impulse is one of my favorite runs like ever. I love it. I guess he always so. comes at the wrong moment for me. Like I, I wouldn't mind it if it's just like I, like right now it's just like Otley being super new to Spider Man and it was super fresh and good. Why mm-hmm. put a stop? Why put a stop to it? Like have that be a good run. Yeah. Well, like you said, that's been a pattern lately. It's just switching it up for no reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That seems kind of weird because, I mean, part of the story or, like, part of the reason that you're involved in the story is, like, the way it's drawn. So, yeah. So, like, it seems kind of weird that they would just switch it up. It's like they don't, they don't even give it a chance to at least, <laughs> at least give me, like, two two arcs of it and then if it wasn't hitting or if, people were, if there were notes on it, okay, give it to Ramos to revive, revive it again because it's obviously going to be a hit. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you know, give it a chance with just one arc. Like, these are wanting more. And I, honestly, he doesn't come back until issue number fuck, 11? 11. He did one through five, and then Ramos took over the next arc, and it was fuck, yeah, eleven. It was only for three issues after that. Gotcha. All yeah, right. Next uh, week it'll be part two with Hunted. Nice. So, um, I did want to mention as well. I know you and me have a mutual dislike of Tom King and what he's doing to Batman. Mm-hmm. Um, he was originally scheduled to write through issue 100. And, and they dropped out, right? From what I've read, he's done with, at 80. 
So I, I believe more. 78 just came out. Yeah. So two more issues and we get rid of Tom King. <laughs> so. <laughs> I, I, I thought I, at first I thought I was like, like 75 or 70 something. I think, I, yeah, so now it's 80. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, they knocked him down to 80. Um, I think because people just can't stand it. Um, but um, yeah, two more issues. And it's a bi weekly comic, so that's one month. So mm. can't wait for that. So um, anything else? Uh, book, movie, or book, comic, anything, guys? No, I think we're good. Awesome. Well, I will pass it over to you, Thomas. Wrap it up for us today. Ba, ba, ba. Yes. So. <laughs> I like that you have an intro every time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, I've had the crude stuck in my head for the longest time, and <laughs> the little animal always makes that noise. And it's, It'll be gone by next week, maybe. Uh, but yeah, awesome stuff, guys. You really took me on a really incredible journey today, Josue, and it touched me. I hope you know that. Oh, I mean, I, I'm going to be, like, updating all of you guys on, like, the runs I'm reading for, because it's been building up, and I need to talk about it all, too. Yes, let it out. <laughs> let it out here. Um, and so, yeah, you guys, you guys aren't reading Spider-Man, so I'll just update you on what's going on there. Yeah, <laughs> you, you make me want to read it, because, yeah, I mean, oh, I always yeah. like the way it's drawn. It's like, like, certain characters just look really good on comics, and mm-hmm. I think Spider-Man is definitely one of them. Um, but that's yeah, even like the lizard looks super dope with Dotley. I've actually never seen like the lizard on comic, so maybe you'll, you can send me your favorite one. Yeah. Show. Oh, there's us. definitely a few. Oh, there's definitely a few arcs with like the lizard. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, um, I, I like that he's never actually looked. There's never like a set way of like how the lizard should look. There was a uh, was it called Primal? There was a storyline with the lizard. I think it was called Primal. Where he, I believe um, I know what you're talking about. I have it. Is that the one where he ate his own son or something? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? Like, <laughs> the, it's, the lizard uh, brain took over the lizard the children, so he ate his own kid. That sounds fucking and, awesome. And it was brutal and, like, crazy looking. Okay, it was, send me, it was send the me arc. that. <laughs> <laughs> it was the arc, I believe, um, when Andrew Garfield's spider was coming out, so they mm-hmm. needed a run for his. And fuck, let me take it out because I found it. And it's like it has one of the sweetest covers. It's like it's yeah. the lizard just like chopping down like Spider Man's neck, and it's all bloody. It doesn't happen in the issue, but the cover is really fucking good. Yeah. But yeah, of course we we probably want to go ahead and wrap up. Yes, we do. But I appreciate <laughs> all of you and all your dedication and time. Uh, we did lose Tom. Uh, apparently, Velocipaster demands that he's in bed by 12.30, so he had to go to bed and deal with some technical issues. Um, Crozen will be back next week, um, but he did reach out to us, and he said, uh, Pulte guys taste like boysenberries, so look forward to that. Nice. <laughs> um, I'm definitely going to get you now. <laughs> uh, but all right, guys, go ahead and say goodbye, and we will wrap this up. All right, Read your books, guys. <laughs> Uh, find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hey, plug, 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 plug. Thank yes. you. Twitter. Major Twitter, Tom. Twitter. I'm walking out the plug. door. Do you think you're funny?